good. So this is a paper about Burkina Faso, and this paper is part of a wider project. This project is called GAP, and it's a set of country case studies. And in these country case studies, we try to figure out a rigorous gross inequality and poverty triangle. So it's a sort of a rigorous poverty assessment, and of course also to come up with the exponentiary factors behind these uh, movements. And after my presentation, there's a presentation by Andy McKay, and also it's not the, the case study within the GAP project he's presenting, but it's somehow related also to that work. And this is joint work with Claude Wetter and Ode Mikema, both from Burkina Faso. Good, so I start with this figure here. So what you see is uh, the blue line. This is uh, growth of GDP per capita in real terms. And you see that this was uh, quite sustained. So in this period, 1994, so just after the devaluation of the uh, CFA franc, you see that there's an average growth of about uh, 3% per year. So that's relatively high. There are, of course, some interruptions. There was a drought in 1997-98. There was a food crisis in 2008. So I get back to these uh, shocks. But overall, this, again, is quite sustained. But if you look at the poverty figures, and these are these uh, red boxes, then you see that there's uh, first an increase of poverty. So it's a poverty headcount. This is basically due to this uh, drought in 97, 98. So if we had household survey data one year earlier, that would be not uh, such extreme and probably not even an increase. If you look then at 2003, we see a slight decline of poverty. And then up to 2009, again, a decline. But it's relatively modest, modest in particular compared to this uh, growth bars. And if we compute the gross elasticity of poverty, we get a value here of minus 0.5. And this is relatively low compared to many other countries where we see an elasticity close to 1, if not uh, significantly above 1. So a question is here, I mean, what happened? And of course, we know if we have such a continuous growth process and we have only a moderate reduction in poverty, so there must be an increase in inequality. And so I try to show you what was driving the increase in inequality. So the story I try to tell is a story where we have basically two sources of growth. The first one is a massive rural urban migration, so people migrating from the rural sector, basically agriculture, to the urban sector, and here basically the informal sector. By migrating, they increase their income because wages, even in the informal sector, are higher than the agriculture sector. It's a compositional effect. And the second source is a moderate increase in agricultural productivity and a more massive increase in uh, land use. So there's an expansion of the land use for agriculture. But in particular, this land expansion and also this migration, these are not sources of growth that are sustainable. So we would need structural change. But this structural change is really absent. I will show you evidence for this. And so because we have this low agricultural productivity and no structured change in the uh, secondary and tertiary sector, food prices go also up. So they are endogenous in this process. And this is eroding, in particular, the purchasing power of the poor because a high share of their cons consumption goes into food. Yeah? And uh, this is so substantial, as I will show, that this is not only increasing uh, poverty, it's also increasing deprivation in uh, health. Yeah, you see that the indicators of uh, children's health over at least an important part of the period I consider here were deteriorating. Good. So let me first look at sectoral growth. So here we have the primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. This is in levels. Um, so it's aggregate GDP in these three sectors. Again, over this uh, period, you have seen in the first slide, you see these um, in all three sectors, we have some growth, of course. I mean, you have seen the, the aggregate GDP before. But of course, if we talk about poverty, we are interested in per capita terms. So we have to bring this uh, into uh, figures uh, per head. So we need to look into population growth first. And if we assume that because the primary sector, this is basically in the rural part of the country, and the secondary and tertiary sector is in the urban part, then we should use these um, differential 
population growth rates. And you see that in rural areas, also the total fertility rate goes much higher in rural areas than in urban areas. Uh, the population growth is only around 2%, whereas in um, urban areas, this is rather around 4 to 7%. Yeah, and this is, again, due to this massive migration from rural to urban areas. Okay. So if we apply now the uh, rural and urban population growth rate to these aggregate GDP figures, then we get these movements here. So you see that there's virtually no growth in per capita terms in the uh, secondary and tertiary sector. There's even a small decline, in fact. And there's a slight growth in the primary sector. So some growth in the agricultural sector, but also not very uh, strong. Okay. So. Okay. Sorry, now. Good. So I said not much of a structural change in the country, and you see that this is confirmed if you look at the uh, employment structure. So here you see that for rural areas and urban areas again. So in rural areas, again, it's basically agriculture. There was, in particular in the 90s and early 2000s, um, a lot of movement into cotton production because the cotton price was going up and the devaluation also promoted these exports that was and still is the main export crop. But, yeah, basically people are in agriculture. And in urban areas, you see that the, the formal sector and the public sector, they did not increase over time. Yeah, if you compare 1994 to 2005, this is uh, the newest figures I have on this, you see that there's still a very, very tiny formal wage sector. And also the public sector is not uh, much larger. So most people are still in the informal non-agriculture sector, or there's also a bit of agriculture in these urban or semi-urban areas. Yeah? But there's no significant change in what people are doing over the time. So that also explains why the, say, the productivity, what we have seen on the previous slide, was not going up over, over time. If you look now specifically into the agriculture sector, um, and here separately for the food crop sector and the cotton sector, you see that um, the uh, increase in production was mainly achieved through an expansion of land. So if you look here in the, uh, to the first and the fourth column, you see that the hectares of cultivable land were significantly increased. But if you look at uh, productivity, so the, the production per land, you see there's um, only a slight increase over time. Yeah, it's about 1% per year. Yeah? So it's all through... Um, the expansion of land. And there was not much of, say, technology adoption in terms of fertilizer or irrigation. All this was quite stagnant. Yeah? So definitely not something you would call here a green revolution. If you look at the cotton price, so I said cotton, the main export crop, um, again, this was uh, quite favorable in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, but since then, there's no further increase here in the price index. So whether you look at the Farmgate price index or the Liverpool price index or the international price, so that's also not any more a uh, substantial source of uh, economic or agriculture growth. Good, so what happens given this uh, low performance in the agriculture sector, what happens to food prices and the purchasing power of the poor. So here you see prices for the three main food crops that are consumed in the country, millet, sorghum, and mice. So they are quite volatile. But if you look at the trend, this is uh, this uh, thin line here, you see that this is uh, continuously increasing. So food stuff gets more and more expensive. So the um, inflation is much higher than for the general CPI. This is uh, this bold line here. Um, the only food stuff or basic cereal that uh, didn't really get very expensive or where the movement was less impressive is rice. But if you calculate the price in uh, per calorie terms, this is so expensive that this is not really um, a possibility to substitute in for the poor population. Yeah? Good. If you look at the budget shares, so again here for three years, 1994, 1998, and 2003, and you have it always for, the, um, for all households, so these rural areas here, then the poorest and the richest quintile. You see that over time, 
the share um, of the uh, total expenditures that is spent on these basic cereals, so the millet, sorghum, and mice, is continuously going up. It was particularly high, of course, in 1998, so after that drought, when food prices were really high. But even in 2003, uh, this is still much higher than in 1998. Yeah, so this documents this uh, continuous erosion of the uh, purchasing power of the poor. And that, of course, was increasing inequality because the rich were less affected by this differential uh, inflation. So to document this a bit further, you can um, apply this decomposition. So some of you may know this uh, Chen Ravelian decomposition, where you decompose a change in poverty into a growth and a distribution component. So you want to know to what extent did general economic growth contribute to a change in poverty and to what extent redistribution. So we add a fourth, uh, sorry, a third component here, and we call it the poverty line effect. So this is um, the differential inflation, so the fact that the goods that are consumed by the poor have a different inflation than the goods that are consumed by the rich. And you see that if you look over this entire period, 1994 to 2003, that indeed growth and redistribution contributed to a poverty reduction, the fact that the purchasing power of the poor was eroded, in fact, offset part of that poverty reduction. So overall, the decline in poverty was quite modest. Yeah? This is this uh, yellow bar. Good, and I said at the beginning that you can even see, of course, this is not causal evidence, it's just suggestive, but um, what this um, yeah, seems to suggest is that this rise in the price of foodstuff um, made it quite difficult, in fact, to bring these uh, indicators of malnutrition down. So if you look at stunting, for instance, you see that at least in the 90s here and early 2000s, that in fact stunting was on the rise and not on the decline. Yeah, also, that was already in the period where the PRSP was implemented and so on, so where, in fact, a lot of uh, effort was made to bring these things down. Yeah. And if you look at these other indicators or the mortality, you see that at least for quite a long time, these things rather deteriorated than uh, improved. So in a conclusion, we can say that um, since 1985, we have uh, almost, a, or we have a doubling of the population, we have a rapid, rapid urbanization, and we have virtually no structural change. So some of a stagnant economy, um, we have now one million more poor people than in uh, 1994, in absolute terms. And so what we need here is some new sources of growth. So again, the land expansion is not sustainable. The, just the migration from workers into the informal sector is not sustainable. So we need technology adoption and other changes in the countryside, and we need uh, changes towards jobs with higher productivity in the urban economy. Yeah? So this is sort of a, I mean, if I refer back to the title, I call it shipping around the Malthusian trap. So it's not that I'm more thinking that, say, the Malthusian model has any validity in general, but we see that some countries in some periods are somehow in a sort of or are at risk in falling in a Malthusian trap yeah, in a sense that we have high population growth that is somehow endogenous to this entire process and we would need somehow um, to lift this country on a, on a new, new, new growth uh, strategy or a new growth path to bring down these population growth rates to increase the, the productivity and therefore to have uh, substantial poverty reduction and to bring inequality levels again down. Maybe a last word. Some of you may know these papers by uh, Pinkowski and Salai Martin and also the paper by Young, two papers that argue that we have uh, a broad poverty reduction in Africa. And I just want to highlight here that the driving force we see here, this endogenous food, food price inflation that is largely driving this increase in inequality and the modest gross elasticity of poverty would not be detected in these two approaches because the Binkowski and Salahim Martin paper is basically relying on aggregate figures, 
and takes just the de distributional pattern from the microdata, does not account for this uh, differential inflation. And the Young paper, where the development is based on the, um, say, asset ownership over time, assumes that the demand elasticity or the income elasticity of demand is constant over time. But if we have such massive changes in relative prices, this is a very strong assumption. Yeah, we cannot assume that the income elasticity of demand would be constant. So again, something which is not incorporated here. And this is the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.